clean enough to protect public health. Those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it. Let's learn our history and recognize that both states and the federal government play valuable roles in ensuring that Americans breathe clean and healthy air. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen, time is reserved. <coughs> Gentleman from Virginia. I, I claim time in opposition. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, this amendment would allow the EPA to override the state and local regulations uh, and thereby gut the purpose of this bill. Uh, let's remember what the common sense purpose of this bill is. There's nothing radical uh, at all about this bill. And in fact, be, in Section 3, uh, this bill protects public health. It protects public health by relying on the state and local uh, regulators uh, who are best equipped to, 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 to make, uh, make judgments uh, about naturally occurring dust uh, and does nothing, does nothing at all uh, to affect the, uh, the Particulate Matter 2.5 standard. Uh, and I think that that's important uh, to note in as much as it seems that the opposition uh, seems to want to forget that. Let's remember the ultimate purpose of this bill, and that is to protect the farmer and the rural businesses from overreaching federal regulation that causes uncertainty and it causes job loss. However, the EPA and the opposition seem, talks about uh, the myth. They say that it's more likely that the EPA would regulate fairy dust. They say that this is a solution in search of a problem. But our farmers know better. Our rural business owners uh, know better. They know better because they are able to, and have looked at uh, the, uh, the, the uh, proposed regulations and the proposals from the EPA staff that's dated back in April, in which they proposed looking at, at, uh, at, at and, and revising the PM10 standard. They also have seen the letter that was sent to my office in, uh, in, in May of this year, in which uh, Ms. McCarthy, the, the, the uh, assistant administrator, makes it clear that agriculture and uh, d agricultural dust and, and dust coming off of roads uh, is absolutely within the, the larger, uh, 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 larger view of these standards. That's what our farmers know. But most of all, they know their experience. They know what they have endured over the years, over the decades uh, of what comes out of Washington and how it affects their uh, everyday, everyday life. Uh, if you look at their track record, uh, you can only see why there is uncertainty and why they believe this is a very, very real threat. I rep I, I'm proud to be able to travel across my rural district in, uh, in, in, uh, in Southside Virginia and Central Virginia and talk to farmers. Uh, in August, I sat down with a group of farmers uh, in Nelson and Albemarle County. Uh, and one of the, the, the farmers that was there is a peach farmer, a fruit grower. Uh, and he said to me, he said, you know, Mr. Hurt, he said, on my farm, where my family has been for generations, growing peaches for our customers, he says, I'm regulated by the Department of Labor, the Department of Agriculture, the FDA, the IRS, the Department of Transportation, the Corps of Engineers, the EPA, and the list goes on when you add the state and local regulators. He says, I'm regulated by all of those different agencies, most of them federal agencies, and all I'm trying to do is grow a peach. How hard can it be? And I think when you look at the common sense purpose of this bill, uh, you will see that this amendment uh, would gut it. And, and, and it is for that reason that I would urge my colleagues uh, to vote against uh, this amendment. Thank you. Does the gentleman uh, yield back his time? I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentlelady from the Virgin Islands has 30 seconds remaining. Well, I'd just like to add that my amendment does not really take away any authority from the state, local, and tribal governments. It just ensures that they set standards that are based on the protection of the public health. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back her time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Well, Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 3, printed in House Report 112-317. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 3, printed in House Report Number 112-317, offered by Mr. Crawford of Arkansas.
Pursuant to House Resolution 487, the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Crawford, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My amendment is very straightforward, and I believe it will help provide the proper amount of interagency communication with the EPA uh, when they go to write uh, air quality standards for particulate matter. The legislation being considered today excludes nuisance dust from the EPA regulatory net, but the bill provides an exemption if the EPA determines that the economic benefits of regulating dust outweigh the cost. My amendment would simply direct the EPA to consult with the Department of Agriculture in making this determination. As a member of the Ag Committee, I've heard testimony from both the Secretary of Agriculture and the EPA Administrator on how their respective agencies propose and write regulations. A problem that became apparent to me is that the two agencies don't even seem to communicate. Neither agency could give me a significant or a sufficient explanation of the protocol for interagency communication between the EPA and the USDA. Their responses were bureaucratic and vague. I find this troubling because if you ask the farmers and ranchers in my Arkansas district about the greatest threat to their operations, they always respond with three letters, EPA. I don't think the response would be the same if both agencies worked together more often. Perhaps the best example of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing occurred this past summer when the president was in his home state of Illinois for a town hall event. One farmer asked the president why the EPA was targeting new regulations at farmers after a difficult growing season through the Midwest and Mid-South this year. The president pointed to Ag Secretary Vilsack for backup and asked the farmer to explain the specific regulations. The farmer cited rules that would be crippling to the ag community, including regulating farm dust. President Obama defiantly dismissed the question by saying, quote, don't always believe what you hear. He later told the crowd, if you ever have a question as to whether it's uh, going to make it harder for you to farm, contact USDA. It seems to me that the president didn't understand that it's the EPA, not the Department of Agriculture, that was the source of this man's frustrations. If the president doesn't realize that the EPA is coming down hard on our nation's farmers and ranchers, then why would the agency itself find it necessary to consider agriculture in proposing regulations? Clearly, it does not. My amendment would ensure that the EPA and the Department of Agriculture work together if the EPA seeks to further regulate the agriculture industry in the future. The Department of Agriculture understands the economic well-being of our nation's farmers, and ranchers better than any other agency and should have a degree of input whenever the EPA writes rules that directly impact farmers and ranchers. This amendment would be a small but important step in that direction. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that I be able to control the time that would be allotted to those in opposition. The gentleman uh, is recognized for five minutes. M Mr. Chairman, uh, this bill is, the Crawford Amendment simply requires EPA to consult with the Secretary of Agriculture before making any determination about the health threat posed by pollution in an area as well as the costs and benefits of taking action. I don't know that the Department of Agriculture has much to contribute in terms of the health threats, uh, but the bill is so objectionable already, and it's hard to argue that this amendment makes it discernibly worse it's a drop in a very large bucket. For that reason, uh, I will not oppose this amendment. We're willing to accept it, uh, but I still uh, am in opposition to the bill. I yield back the ba balance. The gentleman yields time. back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arkansas. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Depending on the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number four printed in House Report 112317. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Yet, yet I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number four printed in House Report number 112-317 offered by Mr. Markey of Massachusetts. Pursuant to House Resolution 487, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, I yield myself uh, two minutes at this time. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, in this legislation, the Republican majority exempts all so-called nuisance dust from the protective air quality standards uh, for coarse uh, particle or soot uh, pollution under the Clean Air Act. Republicans have defined nuisance dust to include particulate matter that is generated from earth moving or other activities that are typically conducted in rural areas. This legislation's broad definition means a bill which is supposed to be all about tractors and farms is actually about barring EPA from regulating the toxic soot that comes out of mines, smelters, chemical plants. And that's because all of these materials come from earth moving. Natural materials are activities that take place in rural areas. Now, I don't know about the 
majority, but when most people hear the word nuisance, they think of things like honking horns, telemarketers, and buzzing flies. They don't think of poison. By preventing EPA from regulating the toxic soot spewing out of mining operations, smelters, chemical facilities, and construction sites, Republicans have apparently decided that poisonous chemicals such as arsenic, lead, and mercury are mere nuisances. This false advertising is not a total surprise. We have heard from Republican witnesses in the past who, in defense of the most polluting industries, have unwillingly offered up the absurd. In fact, in the last Congress, at a hearing I chaired, the Republican witness said he would be happy to sprinkle arsenic-laced coal ash on his cereal. It turns out that the Republican witness is not alone in his suggestion to use arsenic as a dietary supplement. Arsenic, which is a major component of mining activities, was famously used to poison and kill a number of prominent people throughout history, including Napoleon, King George III, and the Emperor of China. In the 19th century, I, at this point, I would like to reclaim the balance, to reserve the balance of my time. Mr. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from Nebraska. I claim the time in opposition. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the, uh, the chairman and uh, appreciate uh, the gentleman from Boston's uh, arguments here about the fact that, uh, or, or suggesting that this bill somehow exempts uh, arsenic and all these poisons, and the reality is it does not. It's an unnecessary amendment. It's, uh, it, one is uh, to make a point that I think is uh, inflated. Uh, the reality is uh, emissions of arsenic above the standard would still be in violation of a EPA rules. The reality also exists, then, if you're going to move the goalpost to a zero particulate, then we've got a different issue here. Now, the dust that we're talking about from agricultural activities, plowing, harvesting, driving on roads, in our own definition says that consists primarily of soil and other natural and biological materials. So if you're going to adopt a new standard, totally different than current standards at the EPA on such issues as arsenic, the reality in rural America is that it is a natural part of our soil, and when dust would kick up and blow, it will be at a particulate level below what the standards are, and we're just trying to say, look, the reality is the EPA even says that at the extremely minor level of particulates that would be inherent in topsoil that could be kicked up by wind or forming, uh, farming activities is not a health risk. In fact, uh, one of the authors of the EPA's most recent integrated science assessment for particulate matter issued in 2010 testified before our committee and stated, quote, for long-term effects of coarse particulates, there is next to no evidence in support of long-term health effects. And in rural America, in Nebraska, we can show you real-life examples. They, uh, in rural America, they have the highest uh, health standards and longevity of life and health. So with that, I will... Uh, let the gentleman close on his amendment and yield back time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Okay. <clears throat> and I yield myself the balance of the time. Gentleman is recognized. In the 19th century, mercury, another common mining waste, was used as a cure-all for toothaches and other ailments. Turns out that the mercury is also highly toxic. It causes severe impacts on the brain and throughout history has been identified as the poison behind many other notable illnesses and deaths in the history of our planet. By defining nuisance dust this way, the Republicans are essentially providing the mining industry with the holiday gift of pollution 
Instead of gold and frankincense and myrrh, the Republicans are bearing gifts of arsenic and lead and mercury for every family in our country. My amendment simply states that so-called nuisance dust doesn't include poisonous arsenic uh, or other heavy metals that are hazardous to human health. Because cancer is not a nuisance. The development of a child's brain is not a nuisance. Yet the Republicans would treat these conditions as a nuisance rather than as medical catastrophes for the families of America. So let's be clear what this bill is all about. This is another attempt by the Republicans to protect big coal by creating another loophole to avoid the Clean Air Act so that families don't have to worry that their children are inhaling these dangerous materials, the arsenic, the lead, the mercury, that they are petrified are going to have a negative long-term impact on their children's development. That's what this is all about, bottom line. And the coal industry is saying no. The Republicans are using the guise of some farm dust cloud of, of, of confusion uh, to mask what they're really trying to do, which is to allow the coal industry to continue to send this lead, this mercury, this arsenic up into the air and into the lungs of children across our country, especially those that are so young that we know it has an impact on their development, especially of their brain. So I urge and I vote on this amendment uh, and uh, I don't think there can be a more important amendment that we're going to vote upon in this Congress, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. On that, I request the yeas and nays. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 5, printed in House Report 112-317. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an, I have an amendment at the The clerk desk. will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 5, printed in House Report Number 112-317, offered by Mr. Waxman of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 487, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, the supporters of this bill say so they're simply trying to exempt harmless dirt from farms and ranches from regulation under the Clean Air Act. That's simply not the case. This bill is nothing more than a bait and switch. The title says it's about farm dust, but in reality, it would exempt air pollution from a number of industrial sources from the entire Clean Air Act, including mines. The bill defines nuisance dust to include particulate matter and it consists primarily of natural materials that's generated from earth moving. So when you look at that definition, it would allow exemption from the requirements of the Clean Air Act from mines. And this is an e egregious overreach that would allow mines to release particulate matter into the air without any controls. The Kennecott, Utah copper mine serves as a perfect example of why this is such a problem. The Kennecott Copper operates one of the largest open pit copper mines in the world in Utah. The mine is even visible from space. Every day they mine about 150,000 tons of copper ore, 330,000 tons of waste rock from its Bingham Canyon mine. Kennecott operations are the single largest source of particulate pollution in Utah. This mine is having, uh, this mi the mine is having a significant impact on air quality, even with the pollution control requirements in place. There's simply no reason, therefore, to say, well, we're going to take care of the issue by exempting these mines from regulation under the Clean Air Act. And that is what this bill would do. It would exempt all 
particle pollution from the mine's activities from the entire Clean Air Act. That mine is now meeting the requirements of the Clean Air Act. They're doing what they need to do to stop the harm from the pollution from that mine. If we adopt this bill, it would allow them to, to, not, to uh, refrain from doing anything but just simply spew the pollution forward. These uh, mining operations, Kennecott and others, can have a significant threat. There are large quantities of both fine and coarse, coarse particulate matter, and un yet under this bill they would be exempt from regulation. So my amendment simply clarifies that this bill does not apply to particle pollution from any mining activities. The science shows that coarse and fine particle pollution, regardless of the source, can trigger asthma attacks, heart attacks, stroke, and premature death. And that's why I oppose exempting favored sources of this pollution from the Clean Air Act, and that's why I oppose the bill. But at a minimum, if we adopt this amendment, we would ensure that the bill is true to its name, the Farm Dust Regulation Prevention Act, Large industrial open pit mines and gravel mining operations shouldn't get a free pass to pollute under the clever pretense of being involved with farmers. And I would urge my colleagues to support this amendment, re exempting the mine operations from coverage under this bill and making sure the bill only covers the uh, coarse particulates from farming operations. Reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time is reserved. Gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just to let me clarify, the purpose of this legislation, H.R. 1633, is to exempt rural dust from costly and unnecessary federal regulation. It doesn't do anything to exempt any kind of facility, source, or mine from environmental regulation. The northeastern part of Washington State, where I represent, is one of the toughest places in the world to mine. And this bill isn't going to change that. Mining and agricultural dust is comprehensively regulated by state agencies and many, many federal statutes currently in place, including the Surface Mining and Control Reclamation Act, Federal Mine Safety and Health Act, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, Clean Water Act, Federal Land Policy and Management Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and many others. This includes regulation by the Department of Interior of dust from wind erosion and vehicle traffic associated with mines. State and local authorities will still have full authority to impose nuisance dust controls, and rural America needs certainty that they won't be second-guessed by the EPA. I urge a no on this amendment. And bottom line, if you stop and think about it, there's a story here. A story of two paths forward. One path has the potential to bring economic growth, jobs, and energy independence to this country. The second path has brought and will continue to bring economic stagnation to our nation. The irony is that the administration seems to continue to advocate for the second path. And of course, I'm talking about the path of EPA overregulation that continues to put a stranglehold on businesses and economic growth in this country. The next phase of EP, the EPA's path is, the America, is America's farmland. And whether you're working in the fields, herding cattle, or driving down a dirt road, the EPA wants to regulate the dust you pick up. The Farm Dust Regulation Prevention Act of 2011 will ensure this, this path is stopped by prohibiting the implementation of a stricter PMT standard for one year and exempting nuisance dust, like farm dust, from any future PMT regulation. I applaud my colleagues, Representative Nome and Hurt, for introducing this important legislation. I urge my colleagues to support it and would like to reserve the balance of my time. Ladies, time is reserved. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, farm dust is not the same thing as pollution from a mine. And my amendment would exclude pollution from a mine as part of this legislation so that it could stay under EPA regulation under the Clean Air Act as it is today. There's no reason to give the mining operations, whether they're in rural or urban areas, a pass not to even meet the requirements to protect the public from unsafe 
pollutants that could cause health, adverse health impacts. I urge adoption of the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentlelady from Washington. Thank you very much. I would like to yield to the chairman of the subcommittee. Thank Whatever you. Time. All right. Mr. Chair, is recognized. Mr. Chair, this is a little off topic, but uh, we have a young man who served the Energy and Commerce Committee and me personally for many years, did an outstanding job. His, ne his name is Jeff Mortier, and uh, tomorrow is his last day as an employee of the House of Representatives, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank him for the great job that he did and to wish him the very best in his new endeavor and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Great vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 6, printed in House Report 112.317. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 6, printed in House Report Number 112-317, offered by Mr. Flake of Arizona. Pursuant to House Resolution 487, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Flake, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. I recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, While well, the Clean Air Act uh, obviously serves a useful purpose, uh, all too often states and localities are tied up in knots just trying to comply with provisions of it where the, the rules that were promulgated in response to the law or amendments to the law just weren't well thought out. And uh, in, in this regard, in 2005, Congress amended the Clean Air Act uh, so states and localities could get off the regulatory hook uh, for so-called exceptional events, dust events. Uh, events that they cannot control but impact uh, air quality. In 2007, the EPI, EPA adopted uh, the exceptional event rule implementing Congress's amendment to the Clean Air Act, but this uh, rule has proven flawed, uh, costly, and inconsistently implemented. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Here's a, a picture. This is an actual photograph of uh, one of the events that happened just this year in the Phoenix area, in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Uh, this was caused by the monsoon. The monsoon comes along and when it rolls along flat ground, it tends to pick up uh, every loose bit of dust or, or dirt that's there, and it causes an event like this. Obviously, this is not uh, something that the state or the state or local governments can control, yet uh, we're, we're forced to go then to the EPA and beg for an exception to the Clean Air Act and, and it's true, proven extremely costly when we have to do it over and over again. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman's time is reserved. The gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to speak on this amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I, I wanted uh, to say to the gentleman that I think his amendment makes a great deal of sense. It, uh, it complies with uh, what I think EPA ought to do under these exceptional circumstances, and we're prepared to accept his amendment. Hey, I does the gentleman yield back his time? And I yield back my time. gentleman yields back his time. gentleman from Arizona? I thank the gentleman. To, uh, I'll just uh, summarize a little more. If you can put that picture back up while we're speaking here. Um, just to give you an idea of, of how prevalent the problem is, uh, in, in, uh, in Arizona, the Maricopa Association of Governments, or MAG, has said that uh, there are more than a, or about 100 exceedances of the PM10 standard this year, all but one, all but one, was from an exceptional event, dust storms that occur naturally. And so the, what happens then is uh, state and localities, as I said, have to go to the EPA and, and beg for an exception to the rule. And uh, in some cases, um, just for an example, uh, if you take all of the events in 2011, uh, the Maricopa Association of Governments is estimating that it will cost over a million dollars, a million dollars, to just argue and put together the paperwork to go to the EPA and say, this was a big monsoon that caused this. It was an exceptional event. And in the end, they may rule in our favor, but the cost of actually going through it, and it's not just uh, Maricopa County, it's not just uh, in Arizona, uh, San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I believe uh, they have noted that the paperwork for just one high wind exceptional event takes more than 400 staff hours to prepare. 
to, to go to the EPA, 400 staff hours for one exceptional event like this to go and say this shouldn't count against our, our air quality or, or account against us in terms of new regulations that will be imposed and cost upon us. So this is an important uh, amendment. It's not just an academic question. I'm glad that all sides recognize it and I thank, this, I thank the gentleman from California uh, for accepting the amendment and uh, I wish to yield time to the gentlelady uh, who is a uh, sponsor of the bill itself. And I, I just want to say that I am a co-sponsor of the bill, the underlying bill upon which this amendment will be attached and I support it and I, uh, I thank her for her, her dogged work at bringing this forward. Thank you. The gentlelady from South Dakota is recognized. Thank you. And I just want to rise in support of the amendment as well that Mr. Flake has brought to the floor. Certainly this amendment would add a sense of Congress to this piece of legislation that the EPA should approach and exclude uh, exceptional events and have a provision such as this. It would give us a consistent and a transparent manner for dealing with these events and certainly rural America and other parts of America need the certainty that the regulation is not triggered by natural events that are out of control. And so I certainly appreciate for that and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlelady and I, just in conclusion, let me just say that the EPA does recognize that there's a problem here and they are working to correct it. It's just taking a long time. And uh, they, the, the rule was promulgated in 2007. Uh, we've had you know, three or four years since that time and every year it costs states and local governments uh, millions of dollars just to seek exceptions uh, with these exceptional events. And, and so I, this, this language, this amendment simply encourages the EPA to move more quickly and that uh, Congress stands ready to help them to fashion a new rule that will truly uh, account for these exceptional events. With that, I urge support for the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It's now in order to consider amendment number seven, printed in House Report 112.317. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number seven, printed in House Report number 112-317, offered by Mr. Shock of Illinois. Pursuant to House Resolution 487, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shock, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise today to offer an amendment with my good friend and colleague, Congresswoman Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Our amendment is really simple and straightforward. It requires the EPA to consider the impact of new agricultural jobs and the economy before issuing new rules and regulations. A similar amendment to the Clean Water Cooperative Federalism Act passed this House in July and it enjoyed broad bipartisan support. My amendment today says that if jobs and the economic well-being of farmers would be negatively impacted, that the EPA will be required to hold public hearings in the impacted state. It would also require the EPA to notify the state's governor, legislature, and congressional district. And it would require that the EPA post their analysis of the negative job impact on their website, request the Secretary of Agriculture to do the same, and request the governor of that state to post that similar analysis on the state capitol website. I don't believe this is too much to ask. We're simply asking for the EPA to calculate the number of jobs lost and the economic impact on the agricultural community with a new rule that would do such. If their calculation turns out to be detrimental, we want the EPA to let our nation's farmers know before they implement additional red tape and new regulation. We expect that the bureaucrats in the EPA here in Washington, D.C. to go out to the real world and understand the impact of the rules that they are implementing, that they are suggesting, and that have a real effect on farmers who are trying to run their operations across America they are helping to feed the world's population. This past weekend, the Illinois Farm Bureau in my home state had their annual meeting, and they conducted a survey of the thousands of farmers who participated at that convention. They asked them an open-ended question. What posed the biggest threat to their future profitability as family farmers? Their answer, was it input costs, lower commodity prices, Land prices, commodity price swings, no. Their answer was overwhelmingly government regulation. Dell Haddon, who is a farmer from Jacksonville, Illinois, recently told me, and I quote, 
The thought of the EPA continuing to place more regulation on my farming operation is unfounded. My family prides itself on being environmentally stewards of our property and making our farm better for the next generation. We do it better here than any other place in the world. Jamie Schaefer, another farmer from my district in Princeville, Illinois, told me that, quote, the EPA overregulation has the potential to shut us down. We wouldn't be able to farm with modern equipment, livestock across, walk across the field and create dust when it's dry out. We need to take regulators out to our farms and personally show them there is no way around dust or dirt. It's just a part of the natural environment. Let's let Dale, Jamie, and other farmers in our country continue to do what they do best and let the EPA bureaucrats understand first, before they implement a new rule, what kind of effect, if any, it will have negatively on jobs and the economy throughout our country. I urge a yes vote, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment, seek time in opposition. Gentleman to the recognize, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I have several concerns about this amendment, which seems to ignore the reality of how agencies communicate along with the well-established process for how EPA proposes and finalizes a rule. First of all, this amendment requires EPA to conduct additional economic analysis for a broad range of agency actions that could affect agriculture, including guidance documents and policy statements, requiring an expensive and time-consuming detailed economic analysis for every policy statement makes no sense. Secondly, this amendment singles out one favored sector for special treatment. Why should we have an entirely different rulemaking process in place for agriculture? If the Republicans are concerned about the rulemaking process, then they should work with us on a bipartisan basis to improve the way rules are adopted for all sectors, not just one. This amendment also isn't, uh, isn't necessary EPA already has to evaluate the costs and benefits of each rule to satisfy requirements in numerous statutes. When issuing a rule, EPA has to comply with the Administrative Procedure Act, the Paperwork Reduction Act, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, specific environmental statutes, executive orders on regulatory planning and review, requirements of the Office of Management and Budget, and others. A minute ago, we accepted an amendment by the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Flake, that called on EPA not to have a burdensome process when they would grant the uh, exceptional events uh, issue for uh, not to count a violation when it was an exceptional event that caused the problem. And he argued we didn't need all that burdensome regulation to, re to get to that result. This additional burdensome regulation is unnecessary. According to the GAO, these requirements are clearly voluminous and require a, range, a wide range of procedural, consultative, and analytical action on the part of the agencies, end quote. This am amendment appears to ignore the well-established process and instead would add another burdensome layer to the already lengthy review. I, it serves no purpose. It bogs down the agency. It creates more bureaucracy. It costs more money. It does not accomplish anything. And insofar as it accomplishes anything, it just stalls the agency from acting in only one area for agriculture. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment as well as oppose the underlying bill, and I reserve whatever time is Gentleman's time is have. reserved. Gentleman from Illinois. Can I inquire as to how much time is remaining? The gentleman has one and one half minutes remaining. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would respond to my friend from California with a couple of points. First of all, uh, we did have the opportunity to apply a similar rule to the entire uh, bureaucracy. We, we passed that yesterday. It was called the RAINS Act. But with regards to specific, specifically pointing out uh, agency by agency, uh, a similar amendment passed earlier this year to the Clean Water Bill, a Clean Water Act uh, that had bipartisan support, and I certainly would hope that this amendment would as well. And finally, to the concern about expense, I can't imagine what's more expensive than putting Americans out of work. I can't think of what's more expensive than asking Americans' farmers uh, to come up with more cash uh, and more expenses because of 
uh, bureaucrats, new rules in Washington, D.C. Uh, and finally, this does not prohibit the agency from doing anything. It just requires the agency to know uh, what they're doing, the impact on jobs, uh, and that to be known by the farmers, the state, the congressional delegation, and certainly the bureaucrats at the APA. With that, I yield a minute to my friend uh, from Colorado, Mr. Gardner. I thank the gentleman from Illinois for this amendment, and it's ironic that the opposition to this amendment characterizes the amendment uh, as a burden. Uh, however, the burden being placed, uh, I would suggest, if it's a burden at all, is on the EPA. Uh, the EPA who actually has to take a look at whether or not this is impacting jobs before the regulation is promulgated. How about that? We actually do something around this place that takes a burden off the private sector and makes government do their job to make sure that they're not hurting jobs in private industry. Uh, you know, this is an amendment that makes absolutely common sense, absolute common sense to look before you leap, to make sure that you understand the impacts of a regulation before you issue it. And that's why I support this House amendment. Time has expired. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have? Gentleman has two minutes remaining. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the EPA goes through an incredible analysis now, the costs and the benefits and all the other considerations. It's appropriate to add another review of regulations at EPA is to require paralysis by analysis, and perhaps that's the objective of the amendment. Gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Shockin, said he can't Im imagine and any more expensive than what this regulation might do to farmers. Well, I'll tell you something that's more expensive. Tax breaks for zillionaires, billionaires, and millionaires is a lot more expensive uh, than uh, what requiring EPA to do even more. Let's not burden the agency with reviews only for one sector that add nothing to the analysis that they already achieve before they adopt any regulation. And these regulations that are already in effect now are not costing jobs. This whole bill is supposed to prevent regulations that have not even been adopted. And uh, we're, we're not losing jobs because of that. We're losing jobs because our economy is not functioning, because we don't have a, a, a willingness by the Republicans to stimulate this economy, get people back to work, and get, our, our, get, our, get jobs for those who need them. I oppose this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Jimmy yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Penny the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number eight, printed in House Report 112317. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in House Report number 112-317, offered by Mr. Al Green of Texas. Pursuant to House Resolution 487, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Al Green, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. There has been much debate as to whether this bill will create or save jobs. There is much speculation based on whether this bill will create or save jobs. When you have few facts, you generally speaking can have much speculation. This amendment addresses speculation. There is some sense in this country that our approval rating is low in Congress because of much speculation. Speculation can breed distrust. Speculation can lead to fact-free debates, a term my good friend Emmanuel Cleaver, representative from Missouri, uses, fact-free debates. This amendment can help us eliminate fact-free debates. This amendment contains less than 100 words, and it addresses the elimination of fact-free debates. It reads, not later than 180 days after the date of enactment of this act, the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency shall transmit to Congress a report estimating the increase or decrease in the number of jobs in the United States that will occur as a result of the enactment of this act. This amendment eliminates 
fact-free debates and speculation. So if you really want to eliminate fact-free debates and speculations, then you should support this amendment. If you believe that this bill really does create or save jobs, then you should support this amendment. If you believe that Carlisle is right, that no lie can live forever, and this will eliminate the possibility of things being done with malice aforethought, you should support this amendment. If you believe that William Cullen Bryant is right, that truth, when crushed to earth, can rise again, you should support this amendment because this amendment will help us to reveal what the truth is. If you believe that fact-free debates ought to be eliminated, you ought to support this amendment. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen, time is reserved. Gentlemen from Colorado seek time in opposition? I do. Gentlemen is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank you. Uh, I, I thank the Mr. Chairman. The, the question I have on that, I understand the confusion uh, about jobs in the EPA. Uh, I think there is a great deal of confusion when it comes to whether or not the EPA is considering jobs in their analysis. Uh, you know, the administration has issued an executive order. We've actually, through the Energy and Commerce Committee, held a number of hearings on the executive order that says, hey, you need to take a look at the impact on jobs when a regulation is promulgated. Uh, we've had testimony from various officials at the EPA talking about whether or not they look at jobs. But there seems to be a great deal of confusion at the EPA uh, over whether they actually care about jobs. But the problem is we ought to take a look at those, th those jobs before the regulations issued. That's exactly what the amendment did that we just passed by Mr. Schock. Uh, addressing jobs clearly is not the, the authority or the, excuse me, the expertise of the EPA. In fact, just ask Assistant Administrator Matthew Stanislaus, who came before our committee, and testified that, indeed, when they issued a regulation, they didn't take a look at the jobs impact, even though about 30 seconds in his statement before, he said they did take a look at the impact on jobs. Uh, to the extent the EPA does comment on the jobs impact of its regulatory agenda, it's been widely criticized for understanding the potential for job losses or for even making far-fetched claims that the regulations create jobs. Uh, at one moment, we had, at one time, we had a, a hearing with uh, Gina McCarthy, the assistant administrator of the EPA who testified that for every, mil for every regulation, a million dollars in regulations, it creates 1.5 jobs. 1.5 jobs for every million dollars in cost of a regulation. That's their idea of a job creating idea or activity. State, local, and tribal governments will be able to enforce their own dust regulations in a way that makes sense for local conditions, including on jobs and the economy. We don't need to spend money on a study to know that avoiding overregulation will benefit the economy. Avoiding overregulation will benefit the economy. Regulations, 1.5 jobs for every $1 million, that's the kind of math that my constituents, many constituents across this country, simply don't understand. I reserve my time. Sir, gentleman from Texas. How much time do I have, uh, Mr. Gentleman Chairman? Gentleman has two and one half minutes remaining. Thank you. Uh, it is an opinion well stated, and I appreciate the opinion that has been well stated. However, the best way to ascertain whether or not jobs are being created or eliminated is to utilize empirical evidence, empirical evidence developed after the fact as opposed to before the actual implementation of the bill. If you believe, and I believe your heart's in the right place, if you believe that this is an opportunity for us to dispel any myths, to dispel any speculation, then let's have a study done after the bill has passed and after there has been some time for implementation. I'm willing to uh, extend the time. I'm willing to have GAO do the study. My heart's in the right place. I want us to have proof positive that this bill does or does not eliminate jobs. I want to eliminate the speculation. And I believe I have enough time left to uh, yield some to my friend. Uh, if, how much do I have left, Mr. Speaker? I would engage in a colloquy with my friend. The gentleman would like to proceed? I, I would yield to you. To, uh, oh, no, I, I, you know, thank you very much for, for the time and consideration. You know, again, uh, we did adopt an amendment that actually takes a look uh, at the regulation before it's offered. And that, before it's put if I may I reclaim time for just a moment. Before, you see, empirical evidence under the scientific method is best acquired after you have the actual evidence. So what you would do is utilize speculation to come to a conclusion and then call that a fact. This would eliminate speculation. I would yield back.
Well, thank you. I, I think I know that if I stub my toe, it's going to hurt before I do it. We ought to be able to check out whether or not it's going to cost jobs before we do it. Reclaiming my time. The question is whether you will actually have the opportunity to hurt your toe, as you put it. There is no, there is no need to avoid things that don't exist. Let us get the actual empirical raw evidence and use that to draw our conclusions as to whether or not this bill creates or saves jobs. I yield back. Well, thank you, the gentleman. You know, the empirical evidence that I will go on come from the groups in Colorado that know this issue the best, the farmers and ranchers that I represent. Here's just a listing of a few of the organizations that support this bill as it Excuse stands. Excuse me, I'm reclaiming my time, because supporting something is not empirical evidence as to whether or not it will do a certain thing. I respect all who are supporting it. By the way, I don't disrespect you. I, I believe your heart's in the right place. What I'm trying to get you to see is if you utilize the scientific method, you will get your empirical evidence after you have given this an opportunity to be enacted. Thank you, and I yield back. time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado. Well, again, I would just like to continue with the list of overwhelming support from those in my district uh, that believe this will indeed cost jobs. We've adopted an amendment that says, hey, let's take a look at it before it goes into effect. Uh, the Colorado Agriculture Organizations, including the Colorado Association of Wheat Growers, the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, the Colorado Corn Growers Association, the Colorado Lamb Council, the Colorado Livestock Association, the Colorado Pork Producers Council, the Colorado Potato Administrative Committee, the Colorado Sheep and Wool Authority, the Colorado Wool Growers Authority, and the Colorado Farm Bureau. These are organizations that will work each and every day under this regulation. And perhaps the EPA says, hey, you know what, we're not going to do this right now. Uh, but they are very concerned. Will the gentleman that, yield? Uh, I will yield. Uh, with all due respect, the world is larger than Colorado. Uh, and there are other organizations and other states that... Well, reclaiming my time, I understand the, 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 there are some, some big concerns from Boston. Uh, there are concerns in Houston. There are some concerns in Los Angeles. But I can tell you in rural Colorado, in rural America, there are grave concerns that there are many people in, in this body that think their concerns over farm dust are nothing more than concerns over pixie dust. The general I would just seconds? close with this argument. I, I think uh, we can go on voting with this. But here's, but if here's you have the, the time, would you, would you be uh, so kind? Uh, please, you. In, in my city, we have a rock crushing company. It yields dust particulate matters. That is something that is of concern to rural uh, people as well. Well, reclaiming as my time, in the and city. the gentleman will recognize that uh, state, local, tribal governments, again, will be able to enforce their, their own dust regulations according to local conditions. And so uh, I understand uh, where you're coming from. I would just oppose this amendment, uh, believing that we need to get on to the underlying bill and adopt the underlying bill so that we can move forward creating jobs, making sure we're not killing jobs, and do what's right for this country when it comes to our economy. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I request the recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in House Report 112.317, on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment number one by Mr. Rush of Illinois. Amendment number two offered by Ms. Christensen of the Virgin Islands. Amendment number four by Mr. Markey of Massachusetts. Amendment number five by Mr. Waxman of California. And amendment number eight by Mr. Al Green of Texas. The chair will reduce to two minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote after the first vote in this series. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number one printed in House Report 112.317 by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in House Report number 112-317, offered by Mr. Rush of Illinois. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. The House has been debating a bill that would limit the Environmental Protection Agency from regulation of farm dust. They've uh, wrapped up debate and a series of amendment votes here. This first one by Bobby Rush of Illinois. This would clarify that the, uh, that the bill does not apply to fine particulate matter. This is a 15-minute vote and the remaining amendment votes will be two-minute votes. Also on Capitol Hill today, the Senate is in session earlier by a vote of 53 to 45. They failed to move forward on the nomination 
uh, Richard Cordray to head the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Shortly after that vote happened this morning, President Obama came out at the White House to talk about that, also to talk about plans on Capitol Hill to extend the payroll tax cut. We're going to show you the president's comments during this vote. They're about 10 minutes. Good morning, everybody. A couple of days ago, I said that we are in a make or break moment when it comes to America's middle class. Uh, we either have a country where everybody fends for themselves, or we create a country where everybody does their fair share, everybody's got a fair chance, and uh, we ensure that there's fair play out there. Now, to ensure fair play, uh, one of the things that I talked about was the importance of making sure we implement financial reform, Wall Street reform that was passed last year. And a key component of that was making sure that we have a consumer watchdog in place who can police what mortgage brokers and payday lenders and other non-bank financial entities are able to do when it comes to consumers. Uh, this is a big deal. About one in five people use these kinds of uh, mechanisms to finance uh, everything from buying a house to cashing their checks. And we passed a law last year that said we need this consumer watchdog in place to make sure that people aren't taken advantage of. Now, we have nominated somebody, Richard Cordray, former Attorney General and Treasurer of Ohio, who everybody says is highly qualified. The majority of attorney generals, Republican and Democrat from across the country, have said this is somebody who can do the job with integrity, who has a tradition of being a bipartisan uh, individual who looks out for the public interest and is ready to go. And he actually helped set up the Consumer Finance Protection Board. Uh, this morning, Senate Republicans blocked his nomination, refusing to let the Senate even uh, go forward with an up or down vote on Mr. Cordray. And this makes absolutely no sense. Consumers across the country understand that part of the reason we got into the final uh, financial mess that we did was because regulators were not doing their jobs. People were not paying attention to what was happening in the housing market. People weren't paying attention to who was being taken advantage of. There were folks who were making a lot of money taking advantage of American consumers. This individual's job is to make sure that individual consumers are protected. Everybody from seniors to young people who are looking for student loans to members of our armed services who are probably more vulnerable than just about anybody uh, when it comes to uh, unscrupulous financial practices. There is no reason why Mr. Cordray should not be nominated and should not be confirmed by the Senate and should not be doing his job right away uh, in order to carry out his, uh, his mandate and his mission. Uh, so I just want to send a message to the Senate. We are not giving up on this. We are going to keep on going at it. Uh, we are not going to allow politics as usual on Capitol Hill to stand in the way of American consumers being protected by unscrupulous financial uh, operators. And we're going to keep on pushing on this issue. Now, uh, the second thing I want to make clear about is that uh, with respect to the payroll tax, you guys have all seen our countdown clock behind us. This is about doing, uh, making sure that everybody is doing their fair share uh, and that the middle class does not see their taxes go up by $1,000 in 23 days. Uh, and we've heard uh, recently some intimations from the Senate Majority Leader and from uh, the Speaker of the House or the Senate Minority Leader and the, speak and the Speaker of the House that they think uh, we should do a payroll tax, uh, but uh, the question is what price will they extract from the President in order to get it done? And I just want to make clear, this is not about me. They shouldn't extend the payroll tax cut for me. They shouldn't extend unemployment insurance for me. This is for 160 million people who in 20, 23 days are going to see their taxes go up if Congress doesn't act. 
This is for 5 million individuals who are out there looking for a job and can't find a job right now in a tough economy who could end up not being able to pay their bills or keep their house if Congress doesn't act. So uh, rather than trying to figure out what can they uh, extract politically from me in order to get this thing done, what they need to do is be focused on what's good for the economy, what's good for jobs, and what's good for the American people. Uh, and I've made very clear, uh, I do not expect Congress to go home unless the payroll tax cut is extended and unless unemployment insurance is extended. Uh, it would be wrong for families, but it would also be wrong for the economy as a whole. All right, with that, I'm going to take a couple questions. Ben. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a very busy time. If I may, I'd like to ask you about two other, uh, two other important issues in the news. Republican candidates have um, taken aim at your approach to foreign policy, particularly the Middle East and Israel, and accused you uh, of appeasement. I wanted to get your reaction to that. And also, I'm wondering if you personally intervened in any way in halting the sale of the morning after uh, pill to those under 17, and whether you think uh, politics trump science in this case. Um, Ask Osama bin Laden and uh, the 22 out of 30 top al-Qaeda leaders who've been taken off the field uh, whether I engage in appeasement uh, or whoever's left out there. Ask them about that. Uh, with respect to uh, the Plan B, uh, I did not uh, get involved in the process. This was a decision that was made by Kathleen Sebelius, uh, uh, the Secretary of HHS. Uh, I will say this, uh, as the father of two daughters, um, uh, I think it is important for us to make sure that um, you know, we apply some common sense to various rules when it comes to uh, over-the-counter medicine. And uh, as I understand it, the reason Kathleen made this decision uh, was uh, she could not be confident that a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old going to a drugstore uh, should be able, alongside bubble gum or batteries, uh, be able to buy uh, a, uh, a medication that uh, potentially, if not used properly, could end up having an adverse effect. Uh, and I think most parents would probably feel the same way. Uh, so, uh, you know, the expectation here is, I think it's very important to understand that for women, for those over 17, this continues to be something that uh, you can go in and purchase from a drugstore. It has been deemed safe by the FDA. Nobody's challenging that. When it comes to 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds, uh, the question is, can we have confidence uh, that they would potentially use uh, Plan B properly. Uh, and her judgment was that there was not enough evidence that this potentially could be used improperly in a way that had adverse health effects uh, on those young people. You fully support the decision? I do. Mr. President, is a recess appointment for Richard Cordray on the table, uh, number one? And number two, uh, the Italian Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, indicated today he may be coming to the White House next month. Do you think he and other European leaders are stepping up in the way you've urged them to, to sort of clear up the debt crisis? Uh, I will not take any options off the table when it comes to getting Richard Cordray in as director of the Consumer Finance Protection Board. Uh, and, and I want to repeat what I said earlier. Uh, this is a law that was passed by Congress that I signed into law that is designed solely to protect American consumers. I don't think there's any cons consumer out there, I don't think there's any American out there who thinks that the reason we got into the big financial mess that we did was because of too much regulation of Wall Street or the financial services industry. I take it back. I'm sure there are some folks in the financial service industry who make that argument, although I'm not sure that they make it with a straight face. Um, so, you know, let's just take a very specific example. All the families out there who have now lost their home after having paid their mortgage uh, over and over again because they were told that they could afford this home. They didn't understand 
all the documentation that was involved. This was peddled deliberately to them, even though a mortgage broker might have known that there was no way that they could keep up with these payments. And now they're out on the street uh, because nobody was making sure that there's fair play and fair dealing uh, in the mortgage industry. On now, wh why wouldn't we want to have somebody just to make sure that people are being treated fairly? You know, especially when not only is that family affected, but our whole economy is affected. This is part of what I was talking about a couple of days ago. We have a Congress right now, uh, Republicans in Congress right now, uh, who seem to have entirely forgotten how we got into this mess. And part of the reason was because we did not empower our regulators to make sure that they were ensuring fair play. That's what the Consumer Finance Protection Board is designed to do. Yeah, we had Holly Petraeus, wife of General Petraeus, who's been working to make sure that our armed services uh, personnel aren't taken advantage of. They get transferred to a base, and uh, next thing they know, they're, they're taking out loans that they think are a good deal, but it turns out that they're paying 100, 150, 200, uh, 200 percent uh, interest rates. Why wouldn't we want somebody in place to make sure that doesn't happen? It doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so the bottom line is you asked about the recess appointment. Uh, we're going to look at all our options. Uh, my hope and expectation is, is that uh, the Republicans who block this nomination come to their senses. Um, and I know that some of them have made an argument, well, we just want to sort of make some modifications in the law. Well, they're free to introduce a bill and get that passed. But part of what's happened over on Capitol Hill, not just on this issue, but on every issue, is they will hold up nominations. Well-qualified judges aren't getting a vote. I've got uh, you know, assistant secretaries to the Treasury who get held up for no reason just because they're trying to see if they can uh, use that to reverse some sort of uh, law that's already been passed. And, and, and that's part of what gets the American people so frustrated, because they don't feel like this thing is on the level. European uh, crisis, do you have any oh, uh, on the European debt crisis. Um, I am uh, obviously very concerned about what's happening in Europe. Uh, I've expressed those concerns repeatedly to uh, President Sarkozy, Chancellor Merkel, uh, all the key leaders involved. Uh, I think they now recognize the urgency of doing something serious and bold. Uh, the question is whether they can muster the political will to get it done. Uh, look, e Europe is wealthy enough that there's no reason why they can't solve this problem. It's not as if we're talking about some impoverished country that uh, doesn't have any resources and uh, is you know, being buffeted by the world markets and they need uh, you know, to come hat in hand uh, and get help. This is Europe with uh, some of the wealthiest countries on earth, collectively one of the largest markets on earth, if not the largest. And so uh, if they muster the political will, they have the capacity to settle markets down, make sure that uh, they are acting responsibly, and that governments like Italy are able to finance their debt. Uh, and I think that Chancellor Merkel has made some progress uh, uh, with other European leaders in uh, uh, trying to move towards a fiscal compact where everybody is playing by the same rules uh, and nobody's acting irresponsibly. Uh, I think that's all for the good, but there's a short-term crisis that has to be resolved uh, to make sure that markets have confidence that uh, Europe stands behind the euro. Uh, and we're going to do everything we can to push them uh, in, in a good direction on this because it has a huge impact on what happens here in the United States. They are our largest trading partner, and uh, uh, you know, we're seeing some
positive signs in our economy. But if we see Europe tank, uh, that obviously could have uh, a big impact on our ability to generate the jobs that we need uh, here in the United States. I'm going to answer one last question. Kristen. Oh, Kristen, welcome. President, thank you. You just called on Congress not to leave until they mm -hmm. resolve this issue over the payroll tax cuts and unemployment insurance benefits. Can you say definitively that you will postpone your own vacation until these two matters are resolved? And also, on Iran, we've heard some sharper language from members of your administration about Iran recently. Are you intentionally trying to ramp up the pressure on Iran, and given that you've stated that no options are off the table, should we take that to mean that you are considering some other options? Um, no options off the table means I'm considering all options. Uh, Can you tell us exactly what those options might be? No. Uh, but what I can say with respect to Iran, I think it's very important uh, to remember, uh, particularly given some of the political noise out there, that this administration has systematically imposed the toughest sanctions on Iraq, uh, on Iran ever. When we came into office, the world was divided, Iran was unified and moving aggressively uh, on its own agenda. Today, Iran is isolated, and the world is unified, and applying the toughest sanctions that Iran's ever experienced, and is having an impact inside of Iran. And that's as a consequence of the extraordinary work that's been done by our national security team. Uh, now, uh, Iran understands that they have a choice. They can break that isolation by acting responsibly and forswearing the development of nuclear weapons, which would still allow them to pursue peaceful nuclear power, like every other country that's a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or they can continue uh, to operate uh, in a fashion that uh, isolates them from the entire world. Uh, and if they uh, are pursuing nuclear weapons, then I have said very clearly that is contrary to the uh, the national security interests of the United States. It's contrary to uh, the national security interests of our allies, including Israel. Uh, and uh, we are going to work with the world community to prevent that. Um, with respect to my vacation, uh, I would not uh, ask anybody to do something I'm not willing to do myself. So. Uh, I know some of you might have been looking forward to a little sun and sand, uh, but the bottom line is is that uh, we are going to stay here as long as it takes to make sure that the American people's taxes don't go up on January 1st and to make sure that folks who desperately need uh, unemployment insurance get that help. And, and there's absolutely no excuse for us not getting it done. Keep, keep in mind on, on the payroll tax, uh, cut. This is something that Democrats and Republicans agreed to last year with little fanfare. And it was good for the economy. And independent economists estimate that for us to not extend it right now, to not extend payroll tax cut, not extend unemployment insurance, would have a significant adverse impact on our economy, right at the time when we're supposed to be growing the economy. So, uh, you know, when I hear uh, the Speaker or the Senate Republican leader, you know, wanting to dicker, wanting to see, you know, what can they extract from us in order to get this done, uh, my response to them is, just do the right thing. Focus on the American people. Focus on the economy right now. I know th the uh, the suggestion right now is is that somehow. Uh, uh, well, this keystone issue uh, will create jobs. That's being determined by the State Department right now, and there is a process. Uh, but here's what I know. However many jobs might be generated by a keystone pipeline, there are going to be a lot fewer than the jobs that are created by extending the payroll tax cut and extending unemployment insurance. Get it done. And if not, you know, uh, maybe we'll have a, uh, uh, you know, 
a white Christmas here in Washington. And, and uh, I look forward to spending a lot of time with you guys uh, uh, between now and uh, the new year. All right? Thank you, guys. If President Obama's impromptu appearance at the White House press room this morning. Ahead of that, the, uh, before that, the House Speaker and other Republican leaders following the Republican conference meeting this morning came out to speak to reporters about that payroll tax cut legislation that the uh, House is going to move through next week. We're going to show you the, uh, the leader's comments as much as we can anyway as this 15-minute vote, an amendment to the EPA bill, continues. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we had a great conversation with our members uh, about a, an agreement that we would move a bill that would extend and reform unemployment benefits, uh, that would uh, extend the payroll tax credit uh, while preserving the Social Security Trust Fund, and would also include some of our jobs initiatives, uh, such as the Keystone Pipeline and Boiler Mac. You know, the President says that uh, uh, American people can't wait on jobs. Well, guess what? We agree wholeheartedly with the President. Now, the Keystone Pipeline Project uh, will create tens of thousands of jobs immediately. It has bipartisan support in the House and Senate. It's pretty clear that uh, the President has decided to push, push this decision off for a year. On this vote, on this vote the A's are one